If you have a child with an autism spectrum disorder who doesn't sleep well, this video is for you. Today, two developmental pediatricians, one of which is also a sleep specialist, are going to be discussing the nuances of sleep difficulties in autism. Today on the discussion, we're bringing in Dr. Deb Lynn Dyken, clinical professor of pediatric University of Iowa, developmental behavioral pediatrician and sleep medicine specialist. Let's bring Dr. Lynn Dyken to the stage. Thank you for taking a few minutes to, to talk with us. How are you? How is your life? Great. Yeah. Just living the dream, right? <laughs> so today, Deb, what I'd like to do mm -hmm. is I have some, I have some slides that I want to talk with you about. So there's you. Look, yep. at, you. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I didn't know when I was doing fellowship, how many children with an autism spectrum disorder have sleep difficulties? So the first question I have, how big of a problem is sleep in, in autism, in an autism spectrum disorder? Like how big of a problem is this? Yeah, I think it's a huge problem. You know, a lot of times um, kids with autism, they don't, um, they lack that social uh, awareness, you know, so they may not understand that nighttime is when we need to go to sleep and we need to, you know, stay in our rooms and stay in our beds and, and things like that. So, you know, in terms of exact percentages, it's hard to say, but I would guess, having done this for quite a while, yeah. that anywhere from 50 to 80 percent of yeah. kids that I see with autism have some sleep difficulties. So yeah. it, it, it's a huge problem. And I think that sometimes just acknowledging that helps people understand, because I would agree, like one of my key review systems, when I meet mm -hmm. with families, you know, I talk about behavior, right? I talk mm -hmm. about developmental skill sets. I talk about diet. I talk mm -hmm. about because so many of the behavioral difficulties I'm seeing in kids, it, it can be mediated to some extent by the fact they don't, they don't sleep. True, true. We know that behavior and, and sleep go hand in hand. You know, if you don't, if you don't sleep well, your behavior is not going to do very well. Um, also, behavior problems can lead to, to sleep difficulties too. You know, if you're having behavior issues at night, if you're having tantrums and things like that, that can make it difficult to, to put um, the kids to sleep. When it comes to sleep difficulties in children uh, with an autism spectrum disorder, you know, from your perspective, I mean, these come in a lot of different categories, but what, is there a way that you can help us kind of think through this? Are, are there common buckets that we can put these problems into to kind of help us understand how we proceed? Yeah, I think so. You know, I think some of the biggest things that we see are um, the insomnias, um, people, kids who have difficulty falling asleep and staying asleep for a variety of reasons. Um, sometimes it can be related to the autism and, you know, sometimes typically developing kids also have these, these issues as well. Um, kind of one of the biggest things in kids is what we call the sleep onset associations. Uh -huh. um, and those are conditions or um, things that happen in order for um, people to fall asleep, including kids too. So, um, for example, um, sometimes we might need to, you know, try to read a book or, or um, you know, I don't advise watching TV, but a lot of people kind of get into the habit of doing those kinds of things in order to transition from being awake to being asleep. Right. And that happens with kids, too. They may need to, um, you know, be patted or rocked or being with a parent or things like that. So yep. the problem is then that they associate falling asleep with those conditions. And if they, if the parent likes, tries to change things, like if they want the child to not sleep with them or not to sleep in their bed, that can be really, really hard too. So we see, we seem to see a lot of those types of things in kids with autism, kids who have a lot of difficulty um, falling asleep and staying asleep too. So uh, that's, that's, and then a lot of times kids with autism, they have communication difficulties, right? So they can't yeah. tell parents, you know, I want this or I want that. And a lot of times it just ends up as behavior. So a lot of families are concerned because there's a, it's not only there's a behavioral difficulty, there's a, you know, developmental struggles that they have during the day, but there's also a safety piece to this. Yeah, that's huge, you know, especially if the kids are, you know, ambulatory and they won't stay in their bed and, you know, they're they're walking out of the bedroom. And in some cases, they have even walked out of the house, which is a, a big safety issue, too. So, yeah, yeah that's that's really difficult. Um so um, the other thing that, that we see, you know, there's, there's also kind of the, the whole sleep apnea thing. We see a lot of sleep apnea mm -hmm. um, with kids, both typically developing and kids in the autism spectrum. And that makes it 
doubly tricky sometimes because, you know, the way we diagnose sleep apnea is to do a sleep study. And that involves um, gluing a lot of wires, taping things onto yeah. your face, your nose, things like that. Because what we're trying to do is measure brain waves and breathing patterns and yeah. all of that. And and kids, a lot of kids with autism have a lot of sensory issues, particularly yeah. around their, their head and face. You know, you can't do a haircut, you can hardly brush their teeth. Right. So it's really difficult. Sometimes we just, you know, we would love to do a sleep study, but the parents say, no, it's just not going to happen. So yeah. you put this stuff on their head and then you ask them to fall asleep yeah. in, a place, in a place that's not, it's in a lab, right? They can't sleep in their beds. Yeah. Right, right. There, there are some home sleep apnea tests, but those are not FDA approved for kids um, under 18 yet. Okay. So for, for kids, they still have to come into the lab to do a diagnostic sleep study. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. all right. All right. So, okay. So that, that brings up this next set of questions. So how, how, you know, how often do these problems present? Like, you know, let's say, let's say sleep apnea, because people know like, okay, kid won't fall asleep, kid won't stay asleep, you know, those mm -hmm. kinds of problems. But when I think about other things, like some of the stuff that I don't understand, like restless leg and, you know, the I'm in night terrors and these kinds of things. Is there any specific way that you look for that are, that you, you, you tell people about like, this is how a problem like this would present? Yeah, you know, especially for sleep apnea, the certainly the things that we look for are like snoring or gasping or kids who have difficulty breathing at night. Um, yeah. And that may be one of the reasons why they are waking up, you know, um, if they have large tonsils, if they've had a lot of problems like ENT symptoms, you know, recurrent strep throat, recurrent otitis media, um, those can all be indications of uh, possible obstructive sleep apnea. And, and sometimes, you know, for those kids that we just talked about that you can't do a sleep study, we may just empirically like refer them to ENT and, and yeah. ENT sometimes can do like a, they, they were doing more sleep endoscopies where they actually look at the airway. Um, and I think they use some, some um, conscious sedation to, to do that as well. So um, interesting. Yeah. The one question I have too that we'll talk about later is sometimes people say, well, let's just clean out the airway. Like, let's go and see the ear, nose, and throat people. Now, is that something that people should have done? If, if okay, let me ask this. So, before they come to see somebody like you, so a primary care provider or a family member who's scared, you know, a lot of times families are nervous. You ask them questions and they say yes to a lot of things. Like, do they snore? Do they wake up sweaty and scared? Do they fall asleep in the middle of the day? Like, you know, you're going to get some yeses there. If their tonsils are, you know, not abnormally large. Mm -hmm. do you still, would you still recommend people send them to an ear, nose, and throat doctor to at least have the assessment? I mean, is that a simpler solution? Yeah, I think so. Especially if you know that it's going to be really difficult to do any kind of diagnostic testing, and and they have not had um, tonsils, tonsillectomy, or adenoidectomy. I think it's always worthwhile to get uh, somebody to to take a look and maybe get their opinion as well. And mm -hmm. sometimes they do say, "Well, we should probably take out the tonsils," or sometimes they say, "No, I don't think that's the issue." So okay, yeah. okay, so it varies. Um, okay, now let's talk yeah. about behavioral approaches. I feel bad about talking to families about, because sometimes there's a behavioral strategy. There's these people, individuals that I serve, that you serve, their lives are already hard enough. Yeah. You know, it's not like I need to give them a shoulda, woulda, coulda talk about sleep props and screen time. And those things are important. But when you think about behavioral approaches that somebody watching this could learn from, is there one that rises to the top? Like, is there one thing you could say, okay, if you're going to do something as a parent, do this, don't do that. Yeah, I think that if they can try to establish good sleep hygiene, you know, good sleep habits, maintaining a regular schedule, uh, doing a regular um, bedtime routine, quiet, you know, calming, soothing activities, you know, maybe reading or or maybe, um, you know, things that the child enjoys, not to hype them up very much. Um, I try to avoid screen time um, within an hour or two of bedtime. Um, you know, there's always concern that the, the light from from the screens are is suppressing your endogenous melatonin secretion yes. so yeah so try to try to avoid screen time um sometimes i've actually with especially with kids with autism spectrum disorder incorporated some sensory things like weighted blankets or compression um shirts um things like that those kids that kind of um become um 
calm down a little bit more with, you know, some of that pressure sensation and things yeah. like that. Um, you know, environmental things, usually maybe a dark, cool, uh, quiet bedroom. Um, but, you know, there's always a, there's always a but. Sometimes kids do better with a little bit of white noise and things like that. So it's kind of individual, um, you know, so those are some of the behavioral strategies that, that I try to recommend. And, and establishing those things early, um, preferably within the first um, six to 12 months of life to get into those good habits can often um, alleviate or reduce some of the issues down the line as well. Um, so, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and what do you tell people about like, you know, like the, oh, there's all these fancy terms like fading and, you know, these kinds of things. Like, do you, do you find that, um, you know, like, uh, that put the kid back to bed, put the kid back to bed over and over and over again. I mean, do you, mm -hmm. if you take it all the way to that place, is it fair to say that, you know, families can have some success if, if they, if they go to that level, you know, the kids up, they go back to bed, they go up, they go back to bed, you put them back to bed until two or three in the morning until they pass out. Yeah. Like, does it ever, it, does it ever elevate to that degree where parents have to send that kind of message? Like, look, we've gone through the steps. We've, we cleaned up the sleep hygiene. We've mm -hmm. done the bedtime routine. We have the picture exchange system that says bath and bed mm -hmm. and brush teeth, all the stuff. Mm -hmm. And sometimes do you ever feel like you have to give parents that level of equipping to know how to fight this? Oh yeah. Difficulty is that? Okay. Yeah. And then it kind of depends on the parent's comfort level too. You know, some parents say, I just can't do that. You know, there's a little right. bit of, um, you know, because, because kids with autism spectrum, they may not learn at the same um, pace as other neurotypical kids. They may have difficulty with um, regulating, you know, emotional control and all of that. So it, it oftentimes depends on parent comfort level as well. So um, the other thing that sometimes helps is, um, I know you had a session on ABA and um, I didn't right. quite make it all the way through um, yeah. that session, but sometimes ABA can help um, if you get, if you can work with your ABA therapist to see if they can incorporate some strategies for sleep as well. So, yes. Yes, yeah. yes. Yes. That's a good point. ABA therapy, seeing it through the lens of a, a behavioral component that we could improve upon by gathering some data. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. like it. I like yeah. it. Um, okay. So this is a good one because, well, let me ask, before we get into this, let me zoom out for a second. How common are pediatric sleep specialists? You know, before we get to when they should seek an evaluation, yeah. what, how accessible are, is your service line? Yeah, unfortunately, there's not a lot of, uh, there's uh, probably as, about as accessible as a DBP, right? Ooh. There's, there's, there's not many. <laughs> what, I want roughly one, at, so there's like 800, 900 <laughs> of us in the world. Okay. So yeah. not, not a lot. So what, what is this, what is the wait list like for you in your current, for, in your experience in your clinic and then national? In, yeah, so clinically, we probably have maybe a, a three to four month wait list. Okay. It's it's not terrible. Um, okay, this is good. So when a parent should seek an evaluation, is it fair to say that maybe they've talked to their primary care provider, maybe they've seen an ear, nose, and throat doctor, um, mm -hmm. sleep issues are um, as problematic as you would guess. And, and usually what I tell families is, look, you got to get you got to engage sleep when sleep is encroaching upon your family dynamic. Like nobody's successful. And I always talk mm -hmm. about, hey, when I was in residency, I didn't sleep a lot, and that yeah. wasn't a great. It wasn't a good look. No. It, it's not good for a family. So it, it, is that? It, are those all fair statements? I mean, is there from your perspective, at, like, do you ever see kids that come and you're like, yeah, you skipped a bunch of steps. This is too. <laughs> you're, you shouldn't be here. Or, or is there any clear delineation for a family member? Like, yeah, do these things, and once they're done come see me. Yeah, you know, I think a lot of general pediatricians can can start with some of the sleep hygiene things. Um, you know, when should they see a sleep um, specialist? I think if, if there's any concern for sleep apnea, if there's snoring, breathing difficulties, um, pauses in breathing at night, they definitely need to see somebody. Um, I think if the child's behavior um, and learning and development are being impacted you know they're not progressing they're they're not doing well in school because of sleep mm -hmm. um if parents have difficulties you know they're not functioning well um it's causing a lot of um chaos and confusion yeah. and yeah. stress at home um i think certainly that would warrant a, an evaluation as well okay so. all right 
it. So there's yeah. a functional piece to this. Okay. Definitely. A um, few more questions. You've been, I, I thank you for carving out some time to talk with us. That oh, where, no where does, um, it, let me ask this. So where does the evaluation start? Like, do they, does it, does it, you know, when you see somebody in your clinic, mm -hmm. what, what happens? So usually um, it starts with a referral. So we, so they do have to be referred in for our clinic. And then we try, we get some baseline information. We have some parent questionnaires that are completed. Um, and we try to get information from school, if they're in school, if they have an IEP, um, some um, medical records from their primary care provider. If they've ever had a sleep study done before, or if they've seen any other specialists, we try to get those records as well. And then we schedule them for, um, it starts with um, a, an outpatient clinic evaluation. So we're right. both, we'll go through their, their medical history, their developmental history, um, as well as a sleep history as well. Um, and uh, do a careful physical examination, including like um, airway, neurologic, um, developmental kind of assessment as well. And then depending on what the issues are, you know, if we think it's more of a behavioral issue or like an anatomical sleep apnea issue, we can decide where to go after that. So. Okay. Okay. Sometimes, you know, when you're doing an assessment, do you ever find people are like, oh yeah, I'm on steroids. And I can't sleep. Oh yeah, I just riddle but I take it at nine o'clock at night. And is that a good fit? Is that, is that you ever run into that where people are taking medications and they just don't realize? Sometimes it's a simple fix. Yes, that those, those are the uh, those are the wins. <laughs> the wins are like uh, concern is actually a morning medicine. Not a we're not. It's not the one you take at bedtime. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right, okay. Um, okay. So a sleep study, we talked a little bit about this. Mm -hmm. You mentioned this. They come, you decide it's necessary. The mm -hmm. stuff goes on the head, mm -hmm. the sleep and some, do these kids, do you ever have times where it's a wash? Like the kids won't sleep? Yeah, we do. Rarely. I mean, we try to screen, we try to prepare the parents as much as possible. And that's part of in, in the clinic visit as well. But yeah. every now and then we have a case where, you know, the, the technician has tried for like four hours and they only have like one electrode on mm -hmm. and you know, everybody's um, at the end of their rope, you know, the technician's done, the kid's done, the parents are done. And we said, you know, we tried um, and it's just not going to work. And so we just, we just leave it be and they don't get charged for the study and, you know, things like that. Yeah. So, okay. so, you know, it's, there's no sense in, in beating a dead horse. If it's just not going to work, it's not going to work. Um, okay. So, yeah. So what yeah. if, what if you do a sleep study and you're like, you know what this kid needs? Mm -hmm. Needs some airway pressure, some kind of a machine <laughs> that goes like, how, what is it? What do you say to a vet? Like I've got individuals I'll serve, you know, that I maybe have seen or individuals I can think of that maybe have other neurodevelopmental conditions aside from autism, like in an individual with Down syndrome as an example. And there's just no way I'm not going to do any of this stuff. What do you do about somebody who won't tolerate CPAP A and B? What are the long-term mm -hmm. consequences of not doing not addressing the airway or the pressure yeah. uh, it relates to, you know, we'll say untreated obstructive sleep apnea. What happens? Yeah. So, yeah, that's tough. You know, if, if, if they've already had their tonsils out and they're still having significant sleep apnea, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of other um, good remedies or treatments at this time. Um, CPAP is kind of a mainstay of, of treatment. Um, if they can't tolerate it, sometimes just a very gradual desensitization approach, you know, just get them to look at the machine or play with the mask. Okay. No, not associated with sleep at all. Just, you know, it's not a scary thing. I I can I can hold it while yeah, I'm watching TV and things like that. Then gradually getting it you them to like put it on their face without strapping it on. Um, yeah. And and some of our behavioral um, psychology folks are really sure. good about helping us with that. So okay. that makes um, sense. Kind of an easy yeah. approach to desensitize. Okay, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Just a couple more questions. We're getting to save the juicy ones for the end. What about medications? <laughs> are there medications that people use that you find to be effective and safe? Mm -hmm. Um, and where does that fit into the algorithm, if at all? Medications do have a role. Um, I think especially with kids with autism, um, kids who have developmental disabilities, because they may have difficulty understanding some of these things, or you may need to have a little bit more up your sleeve in terms of your, um, you know, therapeutic armamentarium, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, so there actually have been studies that have looked at melatonin for kids yeah. with sleep problems in autism. 
autism. And, and it seems like there's a subset of kids um, that it seems very effective for. So um, I I do try melatonin first. Um, sometimes, um, and they've rec recently come out with gummy forms too, which is great yeah. because it used to be, you know, they would have to either swallow the pill or right, right. Um, chew it up and things like that. But I've had pretty good success with the melatonin gummies. Um, sometimes um, that seems to help quite a bit. Um, if melatonin has been tried and does not work, kind of my next step is looking at things like um, guanfacine or clonidine, those alpha-2 agonists, especially if there's a, a component of hyperactivity or ADHD that's going along too with, with those kids. Um, you know, they all often have a little bit of sedation as well, so that can help quite a bit too. And then kind of the, the next step then, if, if there's some aggressive behaviors, um, kids who are, you know, aggressive, disruptive, so uh, SIB, things like that, uh, risperidone would be kind of my, my choice. Risperidone or aripiprazole, yep. um, Abilify would, would be kind of some things to look at. Of course, those all have metabolic side effects. You got to do monitoring labs, all that stuff. So, um, but those are kind of the, the three that I kind of go with in terms of sleep okay. um, medications. I try not to use, some people try the, the antihistamines, you know, the Benadryl yep. and diphenhydramine. Right, right. I, I have had more problems with paradoxical excitation um, than sedation with those antihistamines. So um, Interesting. That's important for people to know. It's like, yeah, sometimes some, you don't want to give Benadryl in the airport and hope that the plane flight goes well because right. it might be really, really bad. You might have to test that out. Right, right. Um, yeah. I mean, Benadryl oftentimes, you know, makes adults sleepy and drowsy, but I think more for kids, it makes them hyper and excited. So uh, it's, yeah. You know, interesting. Know. Okay. Yeah. Well, just one clarification point. Melatonin's got a little bit of a bad rap. I mean, if you look around, you can find some goods and some bads. The American Academy of Neurology says, yeah, it has a place in the algorithm of sleep issues in individuals with autism. From your perspective, are there any pubertal concerns or any of those kinds of things that you see out there? I mean, the studies yeah. aren't necessarily new. I mean, you know, it's yeah. humans and rats are different, it turns out. Is anything that people ask you or that you've heard at conferences that you think might be helpful here? Yeah, I've heard those those things too. And I think, like you said, a lot of those were animal studies. Right. Uh, some of the reports that I've seen in humans had doses that were like mega, mega doses, like 200 uh -huh. milligrams Ooh. and stuff like that. So, yeah. you know, I usually tell people that as long as you stay below like 10 milligrams, right. um, I haven't seen any uh, reports of significant side effects like like the things you're talking about. Gotcha. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Well, last question. Anything you want families to know? I mean, it just, is there any message that you want to leave them with? It's like, you know what, from a specialist, let me tell you this. <laughs> wow. Um, anything I want them to know? Um, just, uh, you know, persistence, um, you know, keep, keep trying. Um, sometimes um, things come in really small increments. You know, I've had families that work for two years to try to get their kids uh, acclimated to CPAP and mm -hmm. um, things like that. So it's, it's sometimes very, very small baby steps. Um, I just saw a, a, a patient just a few days ago where um, they were on the spectrum and they were used, they were conditioned to not only falling asleep in the parents' room, but also with the mom like present. So it, there were two associations, it's the parents' bedroom and also mom. So we said, you might need to at least work on one at a time, trying to get him maybe into a separate bed, but still in the same bedroom as mom, and then gradually moving the bed closer to the door and maybe eventually out the door, down the hall, into his bedroom, mm. um, and, and maybe doing a couple of months at a time with with each step. So it can be a very, very slow process as long as you're, you know, making progress. And, and kids with autism, you know, they kind of progress at their own pace. So like, just like their speech and communication, it may take a while, but just to keep, keep persistent, keep yeah. at it. So yeah. I got you. Okay. Yeah. Well, this was helpful. I really appreciate your time, energy and resources and what you're doing for the kids uh, in yeah. the fine, fine state of Iowa. 